Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Good. Man, it's so good to be with you guys. You might be able to hear from my voice. We just got back from Ignite Summer Camp on Friday, and man, it was incredible. I'm telling you, we always say like, man, it was awesome. God changed so many lives. And, uh, you know, I said, today I'm going to actually tell them a couple stories of how God changed lives. Because I get nervous that your kids just come back and they tell you about all the pranks or all the games. And they're like, what do you do there? Let me tell you what else we do there, okay. Um, there was one night where some leader just felt prompted to go lay hands on uh, another student there and just pray for her. And didn't really have anything specific. Just prayed a gen, uh, general prayer. And in that moment, man, when God wants to move, he moves. So in that moment, the girl just became full of the Holy Spirit, started speaking in her prayer language. And she left completely different than when she came in. There was another night that uh, I was standing on the stage and I was trying to explain to people like, hey, you don't have a junior Holy Spirit just because, you know, you're in junior high and high school. You got the same Holy Spirit that, that the adults have in the main service. And so I was saying some of you, you know, God's telling you to go uh, do something or, or, you know, whatever. Just be obedient to that. And so one girl stepped out in obedience with what God was telling her to do. And she went to another girl and she said, hey, I just want to tell you, I feel like God wants me to tell you, you're stronger than you think. And the girl just started crying. Because little did that girl know that this girl had been having suicidal thoughts for months. And she thought she was too weak to keep fighting them. And she figured that soon she'd eventually just give in. But that night at camp, she left knowing that she is stronger than she thinks by the power of Christ. That God does have a plan for her. That he does have a purpose for her. And so when we say, when we say, you know, that, man, summer camp was changing people's lives. We don't just say it, man. We mean it. And I just want to take a second to thank everybody who prayed for us, everybody who sent your kids, everybody uh, who maybe sponsored a kid. And especially if you were with us at Ignite Summer Camp as a leader or a student, would you just raise your hand? Um, woo! Will you give it up? For These guys are rock stars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys mean more to me than you will ever know. Uh, well, anyway, I'm excited to bring the word. I am obviously not Pastor Jim. No secret. Uh, sorry that you still came. I'm just kidding. But, but I do know they're watching online. And let me tell you something that I genuinely believe with all my heart. When I step on this platform, I know that so many other people have worked so hard and put in so many hours uh, to make sure that this thing's actually here and that this church is doing all that it can for God. And nobody has put in more hours than Pastor Jim and Miss Tamara. So could we just let them know how much we love them, how much we honor them. We love you guys so much. We'll see you when you get back. Well, I want to start in a way... It might confuse you, but you'll see where I'm going with it, okay? Here's what we're going to do to start. I'm going to put several different pictures on the screen. I'm going to say the name. And then I just kind of want you to see and think about some of the adjectives that come to your mind when you see these people. Okay? Let's try the first one. Ready? The Terminator. Not me. There he is. What comes to your mind? Probably something like tough, bad man. Governor of California, I don't know. All kind of things that could come to your mind, right? Someone you don't mess with. What about this one? Mother Teresa. Probably something similar. No, I'm playing. Probably something like sweet, kind, compassionate, generous. All right, last one. Stayed local, going to have some fun. What about Pastor James Robert Graff? Oh, I'm going to have fun today. Um, man, he's such a good pastor. You probably say something like wise, caring, loving, hard worker. Why do I start this name? Because a name, why do I start this way? I'm sorry. Because a name is so much more than just a name. When you hear a name, it carries things with it. A name communicates a nature. That's why when you hear the Terminator and Jim Graff, you think of things. One is a bad man who will take your head off your neck and ride off in the chopper. And the other one is the Terminator. Like certain. I've been waiting all week to make that joke. I'm dead serious. Like that's my favorite part of my sermon. Isn't that terrible? 
But now that I've made my point that a name communicates a nature, let me get into the word. We're in a series, we're going through the Lord's Prayer. And we've been taking the Lord's Prayer line by line and asking like, how does it build good communities around us? And so we started in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. These are Jesus' own words giving us a model and a template for how we should pray. And he says this, he says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, that's what we covered last week, our Father in heaven. And here's where we're at today. Hallowed be your name. Everybody say hallowed. These are Jesus' words. And Jesus' words, he says, when you go to God in prayer, the very first thing you should ask for is that my name be hallowed, that my name be acknowledged, set apart, really given credibility. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go to pray, that's not often the first thing I ask for. Maybe it is for you, or maybe you're more like me, and the first thing that we ask for is maybe like peace. God, give me peace. God, give me clarity. Give me direction. Give me money. You know what I mean? And those things aren't bad, but if we take Jesus' words seriously, they're out of order. And I think if we really knew what it meant to hollow God's name, we would have our prayers start there. But many of us feel like the kid who was with his parents there on a road trip. And you know how road trips are. When you get in the absolute middle of nowhere, that's when your car breaks down. And that's what happens to his parents. Car breaks down in the middle of nowhere and the kid shouts from the back. He's like, Mom, we got to call Howard. She's like, baby, what are you talking about? Stay back there. Watch Coco Melon. Let me figure this out. And so they're figuring it out, figuring it out. Finally, she's like, Mom, come on. You tell me Howard can fix anything. And you say how great Howard is all the time. Finally, the dad's like, okay, who is Howard? Okay. And she's like, honey, I, I promise I have no idea what he's talking about. So they keep working it out, keep working it out. Finally, the kid's like, you guys are being hypocrites. We got to talk to Howard. She's like, baby, are you talking about God? And he says, well, duh, our Father in heaven, Howard be thy name. <laughs> that's funny, right? Listen, that's how it feels sometimes. We hear, hallowed be thy name. I don't know what that means, but praise the Lord, right? We just go about our day. It's confusing. Why does Jesus tell me, hey, when you pray, here's the first thing I need you to ask for. I need you to ask that my name is hallowed. Because a name communicates a nature. So think about it like this. You ever watch like a superhero movie? And everything's going sideways, everything's terrible. And then let's say like Batman shows up. And they're like, oh, it's Batman. And now everything changes. It's not like all the problems went away, but they're no longer first priority because of who's standing with you. God uses prayer like this. He says, hey, the first thing I need you to do is acknowledge my name and my nature. Acknowledge who is with you. Because sometimes you get out of prayer and it's not like all your problems magically go away, but when you really know who God is, they're not your first priority anymore because you understand who's standing with you. Sometimes you leave prayer with the same problem, but a deeper confidence in your heart that God's going to take care of it. So watch this. It's not just that when you said amen, your kids magically got their act together. But maybe you walk away from prayer with a deeper confidence in your heart of the name and nature of a God who's been able to deliver his kids since Israel was stuck back in Egypt. Maybe when you say amen, it's not that all of your sins get washed and, and you are no longer struggling with anything anymore. You walk out a perfect saint. But maybe you say amen and you're reminded of the name and the nature of a God whose character is steadfast in love, slow to anger, who, of, of someone who has been so patient with his disciples as they always got it, you know, always had to get it together. And, and you realize, you know what, maybe God's being patient with me too. Prayer has to start with hollowing God's name. Why? Because only when you know God's name and his nature do you even know what to ask for in the first place. So, what does it mean to hollow God's name? I'm going to show you three things from this scripture. Three things, here they are. I'll tell them to you, then I'll explain it. It means that first of all, I have access to God's name. Everybody say access. 
Second of all, it means I have accountability to God's name. Everybody say accountability. And I have both of these things because at the end of the day, I have deep affection for God's name. Everybody say affection. So let's get into it. What does it mean to hollow God's name? First of all, we have access to the name. You ever had access to something because you were associated with somebody? Like you weren't on the guest list originally, and then they were like, oh, you know that person? Okay, fine, fine, fine. You can come, and it hurts your feelings a little bit, but you're like, thank you. You know what I mean? You ever had that? I've told you this story before, but it's one of my favorites. When I was in college, my junior year of college, I saw a very pretty girl with curly hair. Her name was Eden Watson. So I walked up to her with all the confidence in the world, and I said, hello, Eden Watson. Would you like to go get corn dogs from Sonic? They're 99 cents today. <laughs> Y'all think I'm kidding. You want to see if a girl believes in you, take her to a cheap date. No, don't. That's a bad idea. It's a bad start, I admit, okay? But she said yes, so joke's on you. <laughs> anyway, we kept talking. Things kept progressing. And eventually I was like, hey, Eden, we should go to a Jinx high school football game. Jinx is like this powerhouse high school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Like it's not uncommon for players there to sign D1, uh, even like go to the NFL. I think like the first three NFL or Super Bowls that – we were watching when we got out of college, Eden had friends playing in that she cheered for in high school. It's just a crazy school. And Eden was the cheer captain uh, at that school. So she still had many friends on the cheer squad. She still had many friends playing in the, uh, on the team. And so I said, look, let's just go and you could kind of show me around. I've always wanted to go watch a Jinx football game, this, that, and the other. So she agrees. Jeffrey, two for two. I just want to throw that out there because I think it's important to the story. So I pick her up from her parents' house, and we're off. We get to the line where the big ticket office is, and we're waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, we get to the front where I can buy tickets for the game, and I see a sign that just put a, a, a pit in my stomach. It said, cash only. Yep. Some of y'all been burned. Oh, my Listen, I'm going to make this a, a relationship sermon for just 30 seconds. Fellas, whenever you go on a date, always bring two forms of payment. How many forms? See, that happened first service. It's all ladies that say two. They're like, two! Because they've been burned. Two forms of payment. So I'm sitting there freaking out. I'm like patting, you know, the universal sign for like, oh, Lord, I don't have it, but make it appear somewhere. I'm doing that number. <laughs> Meanwhile, Eden's like stooping her head like, this is so embarrassing. Oh. And then, praise be to God, a ram in the thicket. The lady stoops her head and she goes, Eden? Eden Watson? Is that you? Eden's like, mm-hmm. She's like, are you with this guy? <laughs> Meanwhile, my dumb self is like, yes, let's just point that out. And she says some magical words. She said, you don't need to pay, girl. Y'all get in here. And I was like, <laughs> who am I with? I was so confused. Who am I with? I told her, I think the concession stand is cash only too. You want to go, go try that again? What happened? When I realized who I was with, I realized what I had access to. And it's the same in prayer. Why do you hollow God's name before anything else? Because you got to realize who's with you so you realize what you got access to. Now, before I preach this, if I were to put a picture of Jesus Christ on the screen like I did the Terminator, what would come to your heart? Because I think a lot of us don't really know who he is. Go study the name of God in Scripture. See how powerful it is. I'm about to show you some of the names of God right now. In Genesis 22, he is our provider. In Exodus 15, he's our healer. In Exodus 17, he's our banner of victory. In Exodus 31, he's our sanctification. In Judges 6, he is our peace. In, in Jeremiah 23, he's our righteousness. In Ezekiel 48, he's the God who's always there. In Psalm 23, he's the good shepherd. So catch this, that means when we pray, hallowed be thy name. What we are saying is, God, I know that I have access to provision, healing, victory, sanctification, peace, righteousness, and ever-present help in time of need in a good shepherd who's always leading me. 
That's what it means. That is our inheritance as children of God. Listen, don't ever forget that the Lord's prayer starts with us saying, Our Father, I don't care how big and bad you are, how self-sufficient you think you are, when you come into prayer, it always should put you in a humble position of a kid who needs their father. You're a child, man. Don't give up your inheritance. Remind yourself of it. David had to. In Psalm 16, verse 5, he prayed, Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. What's he doing? He's reminding himself, if I have God, that is my inheritance. If I have God, that's all I need. Why? Because if I have God, I know his name and his nature. If I have God, that means I have access to clarity, to peace, to love, to joy, to guidance, to provision. To provision. If I have God, I got access to it all. That's where prayer starts. And when you really know who God is, man, it changes things. So let me tell you how this has looked in my life. And maybe it will give you um, maybe some help of how it could look in yours. See, of all the names of God, the most meaningful to me in this season of my life is the fact that he's a good shepherd. That he's leading. And he's guiding my life. He's leading me to good things, getting me through bad things. Because here's the truth. When you're 27 years old, I'm 27. When you're 27 years old, you got a lot of questions. Like, I don't know. I don't know what the rest of my life is supposed to look like career-wise. I don't know when we're supposed to start having kids. I don't know how, when, will. And I am tempted to get so nervous and to run to God in prayer and just be like, God, give me some answers. But Jesus says, no, Jeffrey, that's not where you start. You start with hallowed be your name. So instead of saying, give me answers, I start saying, Lord, I'm a little confused, but I know that you're a good shepherd. And then I start thinking about all the times where he's been such a good shepherd in my life. I think about when I was 18. I didn't know where I should go to college. I didn't want to leave Victoria. But God led me to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I studied the word for four years. Where I met my wife, where I was given an amazing second family. And then after that, I was 22. And again, I was like, God, I don't know where to go. And he led me to Los Angeles. For three years where I got my master's. And I was thinking, I don't know why I'm in Los Angeles. I don't know nobody here. But he took care of everything, helped me pay for school. I mean, uh, uh, amazing. So now at 27, I try to remember not just, Lord, give me answers. I try to remember th the Lord is my shepherd. Let me acknowledge that name before I get all crazy and anxious and freak myself out. And I start recounting what God's done. Lord, you remember when I was 18 and you led me to Tulsa? Man, you knew better than me, didn't you? Lord, you remember when I was 22 and you led me to Los Angeles? You knew a lot better than me, didn't you? So now at 27, instead of saying, Lord, I need answers, help, help, I start with the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He's guiding me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And if I walk through valleys and shadows, I'm not going to fear it. Why? Because he is with me. That prayer does not come from my head. That prayer comes from my heart because I could point to time after time where God's nature and his name was revealed in my life. And so for you, I'm just asking, what about you? Looking back on your life, do you know who God has been to you? you got to remember his name. If he did it back then, he'll do it again. I get out of prayer and I might not have all the answers, but i got a deep confidence in God. I'm reminded of Paul's words when he says, praise God who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And I start to remember what my inheritance is in prayer. Love, that's my inheritance. Peace, that's my inheritance. Joy, guidance, provision, those things are my inheritance. If God did it back then, why won't he now? It's like that song, faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't. I love that part. He won't. No answers, just, yeah, yeah, he won't. Sometimes I come out of prayer. He's like, you got the answers. I'm like, I don't, but he won't. And that's a good enough answer because it displays a lot of trust in a God whose name and nature you really know. Now, that was the access. Everybody say access. But now let me shift gears. Because the truth is when you pray, it shouldn't be all about what God can do for you. It should also be about what God can do through you. I love the quote. It says, prayer is a mighty instrument, not forgetting man's will done in heaven, forgetting God's will done on earth. See, prayer should not be a selfish thing. 
In fact, Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer as a response to very selfish prayer four verses earlier. These people were praying publicly and they were making a big old stink about how good they looked. And they were just using prayer to make sure everybody knew that they looked good. And Jesus said, no, 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 stop that. Listen, when you pray, you go away by yourself. Don't even have the temptation to put the, the focus on you. Don't even have the temptation to, to ask, you know, what am I getting out of this? He said, instead, the first thing you need to ask is that my name be hallowed. Because when you understand what it means to hallow the name of God, you understand it's not just about access to the name. It's about accountability to the name. Everybody say accountability. What it means to hallow God's name. If you're taking notes, we have accountability to the name. When you got someone's name, there is a certain accountability that comes with that. If you don't believe me, that's why when your kids act a fool, you're like, "Mm mm-mm, my kids don't act like that. Right? Hey, there's a certain accountability that comes when you have the last name Graf and you live in Victoria, Texas. I can't act however I want to H-E-B. People, learn that the hard way. I'm serious. I need y'all's, I'm not kidding. It's H-E-B, the dumb machine wouldn't work. You start punching your pin like it's the machine fault. Somebody swooped by, they were like, see you at church, pastor. <laughs> Blessed be the name, you know. What are you going to do? We left, we left H-E-B the other day. <laughs> Man, if, you're, if the person who I'm about to tell this story on is here, come give me a hug later. Um, <sighs> Father, forgive me. We left H-E-B. I just had like a, one little dumb bag of medicine, one bag, right? And I was in a hurry. I was walking to my car, and this beautiful, sweet lady of Christ is parked next to me. And she got all four doors open, loading her car. And I'm like, I can't even get to my car, like for real. And so Eden sees the frustration well enough within me, and she gives me that look, like, we've been here before. You know the consequences. Stop it. So I was like, yes, ma'am. So I'm just waiting for this lady to finish loading her car. <laughs> she finally shuts all the doors, and she sees that we're ladies. Such a sweet lady. She felt bad about it. She's like, I am so so. Are you Pastor G? <laughs> she said, baby, when are you preaching again? And I, in that moment, I thought, Lord, thank you for my wife, and thank you that I lived accountable to my last name. But here's where I'm going with this. There is a greater, much, much, much greater name than Graf that we all carry as believers. Especially, man, when you get baptized, little pop quiz. What did the pastor say when he baptized you? I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As believers, we carry the name of God. And when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we are not just asking for access to the benefits, we're asking for accountability to the responsibility. We're asking for accountability to the responsibility of what it means to be in the family of God. Let me prove it from the Bible, okay? 1 Peter 3, 13 through 15. It says this, now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or don't be afraid of their threats. Now watch this, verse 15, I I underlined it because I want you to see something. It says this, instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. Everybody say, worship Christ as Lord of your life. Now, the New Testament was written in Greek, and if you were to actually read that in the original language, it says, in your heart, you must hollow God. He uses the exact same word that Jesus uses when he says, you need to pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So you know what this tells us? It tells us that hollowing God isn't just something we ask him to do. It's something we say, use me to do it too. Use me to carry your name well. When Peter is writing this, he's basically saying, you make sure that you live in a way where you are hollowing God's name. There's an accountability to it. So so how do we practically hollow the name of God in, in our lives? I do not want anybody here to leave today without knowing how to really hollow God's name. If you go back to the plant, you go back to your office, you go back to school or college, I want us to know how do we practically hollow the name of God. So I'm gonna work back through the scripture, 
And I want to show you 1 Peter 3, 13 through 15. You ready? He says this. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? Everybody say, do good. Verse 14. But even if, everybody say, even if. Even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. You must hollow God in your heart. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Good, you're already catching on. So let me tell you from this scripture, three very practical ways to hollow God in your heart so you're really living accountable to the name that you're carrying. You ready? It's very simple. You do good even if, and you explain it too. Say that, do good even if, and explain it too. Now let me put it in your world, okay? Let's say you work at the plant, and you got that one coworker that's just always grumpy, Always crusty, musty, and dusty for no good reason. Just he walks in and the air sucks out of the room. Guess what? I know they're there. Do good. Smile. Still love them. Or order them a lunch plate when they do the all call. Do good. Even if. Even if he never appreciates it. Even if he comes to work and he's still just as crabby as the day before. Because I promise you, eventually somebody's going to be like, why are you so nice to him when he's so rude? And guess what? That's your chance to explain it too. And you get to say, man, I do good to him even if he doesn't do good to us. Because my whole faith is founded on a God who did good to me when I didn't do good to him. So I'm just living to try to spread his name, to spread his glory, to let him know that even if he never did good, I'll still do good because that's the nature of my father in heaven. What happened? You did good even if, and you explained it too. God's name looked really good on you because you just hollowed it. You see? It's not rocket science. Let's say you got a hard teacher, a hard boss, and everybody complains about him. And maybe for good reason. We're not all working for perfect people. But guess what? You do good. You pray for them. You refuse to speak evil about them. Even if they don't know you're doing that. Even if one day you get to tell them how you feel and they don't see it eye to eye. Even if they don't know that you are literally the only one who refuses to dishonor their name. Because I promise you, eventually, somebody will say, why are you the only one that doesn't chime in when we're roasting the boss? And guess what? You get to explain it too. You get to say, because the truth is... I serve a God who tells me to be respectful to my authorities. And honestly, man, I know that I'm accountable to a higher power. And let me tell you about the higher power. The higher power I serve is named Jesus Christ. He's patient with me when I'm trying to get it together. So I know that I should be patient with them when they're trying to get it together too. You do good even if. And then guess what? You get to explain it too. And just like that, you hollow the name of God and God's name looks really good on you. That's why, it, that's what it is to hollow God's name. Man, when I was reading this in the office just between services, I started thinking about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because listen, here's what I genuinely believe. I believe God will continue to spread his kingdom when he has believers that will do good even if and explain it too. And I started thinking about them. If you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were told to bow down to the, to the gods of their culture. But they chose to do good. Even if it led to consequences. They literally stared at the king and they said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we will never bow to you. We know our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, and they went into the fire and God rewarded their do good even if attitude. And eventually there was a fourth man in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar was uh, confused. He pulled them three out. And they said, who was the, first man, the fourth man? And they got to explain it too. And they saw God change their country. What's going to happen? How are we going to see God actually make a move in our country? It's when people will live with enough faith to do good, even if. But we get stuck on the even if. L like, oh, I'll do it if the rewards are there. I'll do Man, we already have so many rewards in, in, in heaven. We have so many things that God has done for us. And when you really realize that, you do good, even if. Explain it too and you start to see the kingdom of God spread like wildfire. And that's what it is to hollow the name of God. God wants his name to be handled right. 
by his children who carry that name. Do you ever have somebody mispronounce your name? Yeah, all of us with weird names. We're about to get close, okay? My name is spelled G-E-O, already weird, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. I, I don't understand when people are like, why did you spell your name like that? As if I came out the womb and was like, doctor. <laughs> I didn't. Stop asking me that. But it, it roll, it like in school, at roll call, it was so confusing because they'd be like, John Graff, because that's my first name. I was like, here. But I actually go by my middle name. They'd be like, okay, Joffrey. And you're like, ah. I don't want to correct you again, teach, but it's wrong. I've been standing at flights. People are like, George. I'm like, did you just not finish it? G-E-O. <laughs> One time I was playing Fortnite, and I'm not very good at Fortnite. Um, I admit it. And this little fifth grader, I was making that up, but he sounded like he hadn't hit puberty. He was talking mess to me. He was like, who's geography grass? <laughs> i like, listen, kid, log off now and study for your spelling test. You need it. I really did tell him that. Listen, he didn't know. I wasn't at H-E-B. He didn't know who I was. Um, <laughs> all right, let me get serious. We don't like when our name is mispronounced. But here's, here's the left hook. Neither does God. And we mispronounce God's name when we live like there's no accountability to it. Don't mispronounce God's name. We got too big of a responsibility, church. People are looking at us and how they see you is how they're going to see God. Let's carry that name well. You always hear Exodus 20 verse 7 and it says, Thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And a lot of people think, hey, that means don't say, oh my God. And I'm not saying you should say it. I think there's plenty of better things that you can say. But to take the name of the Lord in vain, that word vain literally means worthless. It's saying, hey, don't make that name worthless. What does that mean? Let me put it this way. When me and Eden got married, she took my name. If she were to live unfaithfully to me, she'd be treating my name as worthless. She would wear it worthlessly. She'd take it in vain. But when you were adopted as sons and daughters of God, you got the name of God. But when we live unfaithfully to God, we take that name in vain. We wear it worthlessly. That's not what we're called to do. Man, I'm not perfect. Lord knows I'm trying. I already confessed my H-E-B sins to you, okay? The playing field is level. But I know the goal, and that's what I'm shooting for. Christians got their name in the first place because they lived so faithfully to Jesus. In Acts 11, 26b, it says, it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Little Christs. In the first century, they didn't know what to call this group that formed after the resurrection. But all they could really say about them is, man, they look so much like Jesus Christ. I guess we'll just call them Christians. And I would hope that if somebody were to hide a camera and follow the people of Faith Family Church around, that they'd arrive at the same conclusion. Man, they have such integrity. They really look like Christ. I know I'm not there, but I know that's where I want to be. I know that's where we should all want to be. It's a great name to believe in. You have access to it. There's accountability to it. But the truth is, if you're going to have access and accountability, the only way to really have that is you got to have a deep affection for the name. Everybody say affection. How do you get affection for God's name? Where you really love God, where you don't just hear his name and it's like, oh, this was rooted in tradition. Oh, this is what I grew up with. How do you come to a point where you really, really love God? Well, he has a lot of names. But the key is seeing the name that he tells you to refer to him by in this prayer. Matthew 6, 9, he says this. This then is how you should pray. Our what? Father. And a lot of people stop there. But he actually says, call me our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Stay with me here. Those two things kind of seem contradictory. Because our father is like, gives this connotation, oh, he's so loving. He's like a dad, especially if you grew up with a good dad and that's your connotation already. He's such a good father. But then he couples it, boom, with in heaven. And then you, you, you are forced to think about the fact that he's also all powerful, that he has all authority. And I've learned that people kind of see God one of these, these two ways. Some people naturally see God as this loving father. 
Some people like me, you more naturally see God as this authority in heaven who has all power and who really cares about right and wrong. And they're both true. You can, you can hear our Father and it makes you think about, oh, he's so loving. And then you hear in heaven and you're forced to realize he's no ordinary father. He has the power to bless my life or take my life in the snap of a fingers if he wants to. And that can scare us until you swing back to the fact that, no, 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 he's, he's my father. See, the fact that he's in heaven and has all authority and all power in heaven means that we should obey him. But the fact that he's our father means that we can trust him. And it's when you can equally understand both things, our father in heaven, our father in heaven. All authority, but you love me. All, all control, all power, but you say relate to me like I'm family. It's like a pendulum, and the more you can swing to one side, the more you can go to the other. The more your heart experiences one side of it, the more your heart really trusts the other side of it. And you want to know how you get a heart change from God. When your heart truly understands that the king of heaven traded his crown for a cross, so that you wouldn't just have to kneel at his feet and call him king, but you could sit by his side and call him father. When you really understand that, that he had all power and all authority to do with our life what he pleased, and what he pleased to do was take our debt on the cross and love us and not leave us where, where he found us, you can't help but praise him. You can't help but thank him. You can't help but just lift your hands and say, God, I don't deserve you. God, I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve anything that you've done for me, but I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for it. A deep affection for God warms your heart. And it's like the, the fire on a candle melts and softens the wax so it can be reshaped. A deep affection for God melts and softens a heart. So that it can be reshaped and reformed. Some of you are in here and, and you're so frustrated because you feel like it's all about obedience for you. And you can never get your heart to line up with your head. Listen, you got to know how much God loves you. It sounds so elementary, but you got to know the goodness of God. The Bible says the goodness of God leads people to repentance. Because when your heart burns with the knowledge of how good he is, despite what you've done, it just shapes and warms and molds your heart so that you want to follow him. Having a deep affection for God's name causes you to know, I have access through the name and I want to live accountable to the name. And ultimately, that is a name to believe in. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. God, I thank you that we could never, never, never do anything without you. God, you're the vine, we're the branches. Lord, I thank you that you had all power, all authority. You were in heaven, and yet you came down to earth, traded that crown for a cross so that we could call you Father, so that we could know love and love in its most pure form. Hey, before we leave, I got two questions for you guys today. Here's the first one. If you're in here today and you're like, man, Pastor G, the truth is, I don't even know if Jesus is the Lord and Savior of my life. I don't know if I've really felt the love of God. But today, if you're in here and you say, today, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I, I really believe in him. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So here's what I want you to do. I'm just going to count to three. And on the count of three, if that's you, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to make you stand up, call you down here. I'm just going to pray right where I am for you, right where you are. But if that's you, you're in here and you feel God knocking on your heart right now. You know he's asking you to give him control. If you're in here and you say, I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life, on the count of three, would you just raise your hand? One, two, three. Awesome, 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 awesome. Wow, wow. Anybody here, you say, that's me. Wave your hand at me so I can see you. Awesome, I see you, I see you. Let me ask you a second question. If you're in here today and you say, Pastor G, man, the truth is, at one point, I was following God, but I have not made him a priority like I should. He's just kind of been an afterthought. But today I know that I need to really rededicate my life. I really need to chase him with everything I have. If you're in here and you say, yeah, I need to start a new chapter with the Lord and take him seriously. 
If that's you, on the count of three, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Awesome, 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 awesome. Wave your hand at me so I can see you. Awesome, awesome. Well, let's do this. Would you put your hand on your heart? And let's all together say, Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a Savior. Thank you for loving me when I didn't care about you. Thank you for running me down when I was running away. Make me new. And if I fall, give me the grace to get back up. Put people in my path who will lead me to you. I believe that you are Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Can we give a hand clap to the people that prayed that prayer today? I do want to let you know, listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you're returning, we want to help you not just start your walk with God. We want to help you run. The church is not just a place where you get saved. It's a place where you get around good people and you work out your salvation. You're with people who are pushing you to God, and we want to be that place for you. Uh, we try to do that several ways. One of the easiest ways for someone to get in touch with you, there's this blue card in the seat back in front of you. Man, whether you're just starting your walk, whether you're returning, whether you want to get baptized, whether you just um, want to actually become a member of Faith Family Church, fill this out. And, and also, if you did pray that prayer, we have a gift at any of the tables when you're leaving. It's like a little white packet. Uh, any of our ushers or, or, or section hosts, they could help you find it. But basically, it's just a, a packet to help you start this race off strong with Christ. It has a devotional in it called 30 Days to a New Beginning. Our, our pastors here wrote it. It's awesome. It gives you like a month to like really figure out what just happened. Because the Bible says when you put your faith in God, you become new. And sometimes when you're a new person, you got to learn how to walk that out. And we're here for you as you, as you uh, walk that out. But anyway, hey, it's always such an honor when I get to preach in here and talk to some of the parents of the kids I pastor as well. You guys are amazing. Love you very much. I hope you have a great day. Give it up for Pastor Larry who's coming. All right, let's tell Pastor G one more time. Thank you for such a good message. Amen. I, I just have so much respect for Jeffrey and Eden and and uh, have tremendous amount of respect for Jeffrey how he's lived his life and and just how he's went each step. And uh, uh, there's not too many 27-year-olds that I know that has as much insight with great maturity uh, that Jeffrey has. And I love listening to him. How about you? Amen. And he's funny, too. <laughs> I love how he makes life funny. Well, let's take a good offering today, okay, for the Lord's work. And uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, let's look at it on the screen. It's uh, from the New Living Translation. And it says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about the things we cannot see. You know, here's the principle that I want us to really grab a hold of today is that faith can see what our natural eyes can't see. And Jeffrey was really preaching about that in, in this regard, that God knows things that you and I don't. He knows things about your life. He knows where he wants to take you, and he'll lead you a step at a time, but he doesn't always give you the whole plan at once. And you have to trust him, right? How many have had times you had to trust God when there wasn't money or when there wasn't this or that? And how many know during this time, listen, uh, you know, inflation's bad and the, the price of gas is ridiculous. Anybody with me? And, uh, and I know all that's going on, but faith still works. The word of God still works. You know, what it just means is God's got to supply a little more. And, uh, and that's what I believe for, that, that there's enough no matter what we're facing. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing for this yesterday, I thought about the story of George Mueller. George Mueller had 120 orphans that he had to feed every day. And so on one particular night, they... The table was set, and they had one piece of bread on each plate, and, and uh, he didn't know what else he was going to feed them. They were out of money, out of food, uh, out of drink. Any, you know, it was just looked pretty tough. And so George Mueller said he did what I did at every meal. He had the kids bow their heads, and he bowed his head, and he prayed and thanked God for his provision. And about as soon as he could say amen, there was a knock at the door. 
And the guy who was the guy who, who, took, who sold all the vegetables in town, he said, I got stuff that's going to spoil. I got to bring it and give it to you. And then in a little bit, the butcher came by. I got meat that's going to spoil. Here, you, you know, fix this for supper. And, and then the milkman came by. How many think they had a pretty good meal when they started with nothing? But see, that's just like God. And that's how we have to live our lives too. We have to live our lives trusting the Lord at, at, at every point. It's clear to me that we have to learn to listen to God and just be faithful to him and let him lead us one step at a time. You know, as, as you give today, just, just, you know, as you give, worship God with your giving and just, just take whatever gift you have and put it in the, in the, in the offering and say, Lord, I'm giving this because I, I believe for what God's going to do, not only in my life, for the lives of those others that are there. You know, one thing I want to share with you as we, as we get ready to, to close today is that if you have a teenager, get them to student ministry night. If you have a young adult, get them to Tuesday night. You see, because, I mean, honestly, and I, you know, I'm, I know I'm a little prejudiced because I watched Jeffrey grow up. And uh, one of my funniest memories of Jeffrey and Emily, that right over there, we hadn't been in this building too long, and uh, right over there, Emily and Jeffrey were playing baseball with a, with a paper wad. And uh, they were having the best time, and I remember just stopping and watching them and laughing as, as they were just being little kids and, and enjoying their life. And I thought, oh, man, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome that, that kids are growing up in the ministry, that the church is, is a place they love to be? And, and I just want to encourage you. I mean, we have one of the best youth pastors in the country. And listen, your kids won't be the same. Now, my granddaughter will probably get mad at me, but she said to me yesterday, she said, she said, Papa, why can't my daily quiet time be like camp? How many get what she's saying? I mean, when the power of God was flowing and, and all that, and I, I think all of us want that, right? And, uh, but the truth is, and what I said to her was, well, honey, you just show up every day. Some days it's like camp. Some days it's like just reading your Bible. But show up every day because you don't ever know which it's going to be. And if you just stay faithful showing up, God will lead you, he'll mature you, and he'll do great things in your life. Thank you so much for being a church that loves God and, and loves people and, and does all the things you do. I'm so grateful to be a part of this wonderful church, and I just want to thank you for all that you do. Let's prepare our offering this morning. All right, well, whether you're giving with the phone or the envelope and the seat back in front of you, let's hold that up and let's bless it together. Father, we thank you so much, God, for the opportunity to be a part of your work here on the earth, God. Thank you that through our tithes and offerings, God, you're doing a work in our lives, you're doing a work in our community, and you're doing a work all the way around the world. So, God, we just give cheerfully. We pray uh, your blessing over our tithes and offerings, that they'd go a long way for your kingdom, for your work. And I pray a blesser, blessing over the giver, Father. As, uh, as we give cheerfully to be a part of what you're doing. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, how many of you guys think it was a good day to be in church today? Can we tell Pastor G, thank you for such a great session, man. That was a good message this morning. Uh, before we go, I want to let you know about a few things. Number one, um, if you uh, filled out one of the blue or orange cards, um, you can drop those in the offering boxes on your way out. Um, same place you would drop off your offering. Um, also, we're going to be having a Connect Group Fair back in the Connection Center, so we're going to be having a party. It's going to be a good time. We have all of our Connect Group leaders. We have all kinds of Connect Groups here at the church, um, which are an opportunity um, for us to be able to connect, to, to meet new people, to grow in our faith. Some of them are, you know, Bible and, and, and different ways to grow. Some of them are special interest groups just to have a good time. But either way, uh, you know, you can make your way back into the Connection Center to check it out. It's going to be a good time. Also, if you came wanting prayer, uh, we're going to have our prayer team up at the front. So if you'd like personal prayer, they would love to pray with you after your service. After service. So just make your way up here. All right. Can I say a prayer of blessing over you before you go? Let's pray. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. You guys have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll see you. Guys, I hope you enjoyed service as much as I did. I know I was really um, convicted at some moments and just really encouraged in other moments that, you know, as soon as we step into a life with Christ and ask him into our heart, he becomes our father and he does become our covering. And that's our heritage. That's our, um, you know, our last name that we get to live with. And we're brothers and sisters in Christ. So welcome to the family if you prayed that prayer. And if you did pray that prayer, I want to encourage you like they were talking about um, to get that white packet. You know, we want to get it to you in whatever way we can. So if what would help us is if you either comment that you, you know, you, you ask God into your heart and we'll get you your information. Or if you message message us um, on Facebook or Instagram or something. We want to get that too because it is very helpful in this new journey. And then I would encourage you too to, to get baptized. I'm over baptism, so I would be contacting you. So hi, it's me that's going to be uh, texting you or calling you. Um, but I would encourage you, you know, that you raised your hand and you made an inward decision and baptism is that outward showing of that decision. And we want to celebrate with you. We want to make you um, feel proud and just uh, come together and celebrate with you. But uh, guys, I hope you all enjoyed service. I hope you all have a blessed, wonderful week. Um, I hope you feel rested after today. Maybe go take a nap or something, eat a good meal, have some family time. But guys, we just love you and we love that you are a part of our church family. And we will see you all next week. Bye guys.